The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Uh, Last week, I felt that it was important that we teach some of the things that you would want to have taught to you if you were suddenly became a Jesus person and all of (laughs) and you had a background of nothing. Because I believe that we're facing a Jesus revolution today, and that's going to require to rethink some things. We said the two most important ingredients uh, was that there'd be a sensitivity. And uh, the other thing is no compromising truth. And the wisdom to put the two of those together, probably not an easy task, but nevertheless, I believe it's going to be essential that we, we get to the point to where we can be sensitive to where a person's coming from, just like... Can you imagine how frustrating it would have been for the if they let the flesh get in the way of those early 12 apostles before there was a New Testament and they found out Gentiles could get saved? All of a sudden, it would be like, where do we start? And I believe that that's really the kind of attitude that we should all have as believers. Um, <clears throat> and truth and sensitivity would be the two blendings of concepts to bring it about. So this is part two. And uh, we talked about the Word of God, the realm of the Spirit. I would put an emphasis on, I've always said that when I look back, uh, I would teach on the will because I saw that that was a a misunderstood uh, area and I watched people who were sincerely hungering after God get burned out. You know, and where intimacy and real relationship with Jesus was lacking, it works filled it up. And so to guard against that, we would have to teach against that. And uh, the thing that uh, I say often, and will continue to say often, because repetition, you, eventually it sinks in for some, uh, but <laughs> no guarantees, but nonetheless, um, the repetition is, I want the constant over the intermittent. And that will be a test for young believers. They will go from experience to experience rather than a moment-by-moment relationship built between them and Jesus. The other would look more exciting and require less effort. Every time you hear something's happening, run, see what it's like, hope you get some goosebumps, hope somehow something happens to you but that's still intermittent. And it's good, but it cannot take the place of a real personal relationship. And that's where the emphasis would have to be. And all of my friends that uh, I saw uh, come in that early Jesus movement, uh, some of them just fell by the wayside because uh, they weren't getting a constant experience. And others got into the Word of God, saw sanctification as a necessary process, and they're leaders to this day. And uh, so it's just a question of that initial approach needs to be one of intimacy. Uh, I wanted to, uh, took some notes from, uh, from some of the reviews on our material because that's coming from a perspective outside of us. Uh, but first of all, I'll give you my personal view is for over 45 years, the Lord taught me how to commune with the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. He taught me in the school of the Spirit, and he taught me how to do it without ceasing. And since then, I've lived most of my days with that supernatural peace as the uh, point of uh, connection that I saw, if that's missing, you lost the connection. You have peace, you're in the connection. And... I was able to touch uh, the presence very easily after a very short period of time, uh, uh, learning to abide 
And for me, it was like almost like a game. I wanted to do chores and things and include him in there, which uh, later uh, I would call dual awareness. And that dual awareness is you don't throw your brains out. You're still around people and circumstances all the time, but you're aware down here of what the atmosphere is like. Is it peaceful or did you lose it? And if you lose it, I learned real quickly, get back there quick because God doesn't want anything coming between you and him. And so that it becomes a lifestyle. The opposite of uh, when I married Jennifer, she lived her pretty much her whole life in low-grade anxiety as a constant. I lived with, with high-grade peace <laughs> as almost a constant. And if I lost it, I got back there quick. Um, and it was the secret place. Um, but uh, the, the truth that I knew was not just how to get there when you lose it, but I also knew that this secret place, yes, it was in my prayer closet. And there was times that I felt like I didn't want to leave. And uh, I always joke about the carpool. I was with a Harvard, uh, brilliant Harvard engineer. Who, uses, who we used to ride to work together, and he would pick me up, and I'd be in that, that special time, and, and it was like, I hear his horn honking, and I know I gotta leave. And when you're that attached in that special time, in the secret place, you don't want to, but you know you've got to. But then the beauty of it is the Lord told me, uh, and I learned at, a, at an early season, just like Brother Lawrence, that prayer is not something you do. Prayer is something and someone you are with. If you could ever get a hold of that concept, then praying unceasingly is not some impossible trait. Because most people would say pray unceasingly, they think, I gotta go to work, I gotta do my job, I gotta talk to other people, I got business meetings, I can't be praying constantly, talking. Well, no, you, can, well, you can't pray in the spirit a lot. You can do that driving a car and everything, just don't close your eyes um, if you're driving a car. But other than that, uh, you're with someone, and boy, no better, uh, for me, it, it was a love story of Jesus, but you know what? It impacted my marriage, because when Jennifer and I would go on a trip, she's not as much of a talker as I am. I just knowing she's there, and to this day, if I go to the grocery store, Jennifer, you want to ride with me? You want to go with me? Prayer is being with someone, but relationship is being with someone, isn't it? It's not just oh, uh, Jennifer and I are married, but uh, we're only married when we talk to each other. No, don't you want to be with someone? Well, if you can't translate that to God, you're missing out on the best that God's got to offer in Christianity. Moment by moment over intermittent relationship. I don't want intermittent relationship. Some of the intermittent is powerful, supernatural experiences that I wouldn't trade for anything, but I would trade it for a moment-by-moment -moment relationship because that's superior. But we can have both. So it's not, it's, not a, it's not something you have to choose. As a matter of fact, the intermittent increases proportional to your intimacy with God. Most of the miracles that I've seen uh, for 45 years were in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Things that were so beautiful, it was like, uh, unless they talk about it, I'm not free to, but boy, I'll tell you what. It's, it's been interesting watching changed lives over the years. So the, the other thing is that Brother Lawrence didn't go in or out of prayer. And I understood that that's, that was my endeavor. And I was doing the same thing. He didn't really cover how to do that. He just said, do it. And, uh, but I became acclimated to that love nature as a young believer. And what I found was kind of a byproduct of that. Uh, along with gifting, I, I'm aware of that, but along with gifting, there was a cultivation of an ability to develop a keen sense of what was going on in the people around me. Now, see, that, that's going to require a lot of dual awareness because it's not about a head thing. It's not about suspicion. It's not about body language. It's discerning of the human spirit, and discernment means the source. They can say the right answers, they can have the right body language, but the heart can be somewhere else. And I always say ladies probably know this from the gut, 
when someone's giving you a false compliment. It's like, oh, the words were the words were nice, but something didn't feel real about that. It probably wasn't, because your heart knows things that your head doesn't know. And even unsaved people, you talk about policemen and firemen, what do they say? Uh, I've learned to go with my gut. At least they locate properly, but that gut is only as reliable as their value system. So an unsaved person may go with their gut and it may learn information from the job, like a fireman or something. Uh, now my head wants to go in there and rescue somebody, but my gut's telling me that it might be too late, that there could be a danger on the other side if I break through or blah, 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 that kind of thing. All right, but it's still, it's only as good as their value system, but you've got Jesus as your value system. That opens up a whole new supernatural realm. And so as I became uh, acclimated to that, to that love nature, me and him, it was also very easy uh, to be sensitive when other people were nervous, angry, hurting. I could sense their emotion, but unless you're at peace, uh, even your discer my discernment isn't any good. If I was anxious, I have no idea what's going on. I have to, I have to go by my five senses, which can be very, very, very wrong because you interpret with the five senses. Discern, you distinguish the source. And if the source is wrong, then you can adjust redemptively. You can give a redemptive solution. Real counsel that's in the heart of a man uh, is drawn out from the spirit, not from your head and experience over the years. Uh, so there is a cumulative wisdom, particularly like on your job or what have you, that you can learn uh, if you're sensitive to your conscience. Uh, I don't think I want to do that again. That was not good. That didn't have a good outcome. And I always said my favorite uh, uh, relationship uh, growing up was I was always surrounded by uh, pastors that were older than me, more experienced than me, and saves you some aggravation, saves you some mistakes, so to speak. Now, I saw that people were angry, nervous, and yet they could have a pleasant delivery. I asked the Lord when he showed me, I said, why do I need to know that? You know, I don't want to know that. What if, the, what if they really reject me and they're smiling at me and they really hate me? I don't think I want to know that. And God said, it isn't about you. It's a gift thing for you to perceive a redemptive solution. Oh, it's about them. Oh, it's about God and people. Oh, okay. Now I'm kind of getting this Christian thing down here. Uh, so I, I, I learned that uh, I could then sense it. If you really wanted to love somebody, you could find a way. God would always give a, 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 a tactic or a scheme as to how to minister effectively. All right. Uh, like, on the one hand, we like to go deeper in the things of God, but on the other hand, I use deeper in a wrong way. They would say, I love my mother, and I'd feel this, mm. I, well, maybe we could go a little deeper on that, and let's pray through that. That deeper is not real. That deeper is, I'm trying to say, no, you don't love your mother. You've got issues. <laughs> and, you know, how do you lovingly help someone that's in that situation? Well, but that sensitivity, where did it come from? Really, don't you think God wants everybody to have that? It's actually called a walk. Well, wait a minute. A walk in the Spirit. Oh, that, that would be kind of a constant. Unless you've got a strange walk where you move like that intermittently. I say a walk implies a flow. And real understanding of the Spirit is understanding flow. Getting caught in, as God promised us, we're going to be caught in the jet stream of His purposes. That's a flow. I don't know about you, but I want to, I want to go with the flow, like that old guy said. His wife's name was Florence. They're, they're married 65 years, and he says, what's the secret? He said, you just learn to go with the flow. Whatever flow says, you go. All right, That might be good advice for all husbands everywhere. Now, here's a description, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, I didn't even realize until I read our description from our publisher that we we're best-selling authors. Do you know that, Jennifer? Yeah, we had a number of books that were best-selling in their category. So, uh, but anyway, here, here's one of the here's one of the the, the publisher's description is he tells uh, I don't know where this would appear wherever the publisher is advertising us, but it was that we spent years cultivating that daily communion. We've trained people that have learned how to deal with their struggles and create a consistent place or the secret place, secret encounters, learning to abide. But I thought it was interesting what they pulled out of our material. This is probably, our publisher probably pulled some of this material out of multiple books. But I love these five bullet points. And I'm saying, you know what? If we're going to face a Jesus revolution, these are the essential ingredients. If we're going to bake a cake, you want all the proper ingredients. Well, here's five things that I think are, I told Jennifer, I says, they're just bullets. But in reality, they're concepts that if we can, uh, if we can impart this more effectively to the body of Christ, I think we're going to, we're going to see, we're going to see, greater change and not burnout, but close a walk with God, a closer sensitivity. And just the way God trained me to where then you get sensitive to other people. There's some people then that uh, you might want to minister to and other people you're supposed to do. Just like in the early church, what they say? There's some people you rebuke, <laughs> some people you pray for them privately. And some people, you lay down your lives for them. Would you know the difference? Would you know the difference? And the bullet number one, because I don't want to waste another day in fruitless living. That was one of Jennifer's statements. Huh? What was it on the back of one of our first books? You went, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of going down dead-end rabbit trails. This works, and she hung up all of her training in all various areas. It says, I'm going with Jesus. This is what works. A return to the simplicity that's in Jesus. But here's bullet number one. To recognize the whispers of your Father in heaven calling you closer. Now, if the Father God in heaven is telling you to draw nigh to him and he will draw nigh to you. He doesn't shout all the time, does he? When's the last time you heard God shout? Well, I, I, there's sometimes I've heard audible voice. There's times I've heard authoritative voice, but over 45 years, I could probably count them on two hands. All right? So it's not about him getting louder. I can't hear God. I can't hear God. It's about you getting quieter. So bullet number one is, and our, our new... Uh, 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 journal that's coming out breaks it down into quiet your flesh connect to God abide in God and that's really the way someone should be trained and that's right on the cover that's just the cover of the book so our publisher says that Dennis and Jennifer are going to teach you how to recognize the whispers whispers means you get quiet be still and know that I'm God like a weaned child with its mother, I have quieted my soul within me. Your soul is noisy. It's like three kids without discipline. That's the flesh, isn't it? Three kids without discipline. Your mind is a steering wheel, and it wants to go all over the place because you think you're smart. It reminds me of those kids in, in, in Publix that are in the little cars, and mom's pushing the cart, but the kid thinks they're really going somewhere. <laughs> At some point, you've got to realize that all that steering didn't get you anywhere. All right? All that overthinking didn't get you anywhere. And then the motor. Guess what? The motor is the emotion. And you can, you can turn that thing all the time, and the emotion can be going wild, but mom's pushing the cart. You know? All that wasted emotion, that engine's not working well. When does it work? When does it actually work? That steering wheel and the motor's running. When you put it in gear, that's the will. And I said, if I ever had to teach over again, new Christians and used Christians, 
new and used. I teach on the will. Because I'll tell you what, it gets you into more trouble. You put stuff in the gear that you had no business. You, the emotion might have been bad enough. But once you acted on it, <laughs> uh, trouble, trouble comes its way knocking on your door. So really, uh, bullet number one out of five, according to our publisher's description, telling people don't waste another day in fruitless living, step into your secret place and learn to live every moment under the canopy of his presence. Their revelatory insights will teach you, and then they give five bullets. And I'm learning from my own bullets from our publisher, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Recognize the whispers of the Father, bullet number one. You've got to get quiet. He's not getting louder. You get quieter. Most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. Your flesh makes way too much noise. You might think your flesh is pretty smart, but in reality, that will be a double whammy against you. It's not about intellect. What was it? Uh, 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 that, that man said that I always thought was so clever. He was brilliant, brilliant intellect. But he says, intellect plus bad judgment equals foolishness. <laughs> it doesn't matter what your IQ is. Bad decisions equals foolishness. As a matter of fact, even in the Bible, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, has absolutely nothing to do with intellect, has nothing to do with intelligence. A fool in the Bible is a self-confident rebel that thinks it's smarter than God, thinks it can figure something out that really should have been surrendered to God. <laughs> A self-confident rebel has nothing to do with your IQ. A fool has said in his heart, there's no God. And they have their own holiday, you know. April 1st. Oh, uh, bullet number two. And again, this, this would be one of the more important things to teach. How to fully yield yourself to the Lord how to yield. It's not in the thinker that you yield. And that's why we have to show people to yield yourself to the Lord. The grace of yielding is the power of God to live. But to yield and surrender, we, we do the exercise here where we teach people, even if you fall back, stand against a wall, and kind of, to go backwards is unnatural. You have to yield your will to do it. And in the process, though, you'll feel that even though you don't want to fall back down here, peace increases to your yielding. Now yield without falling back. You know the location. This is where you yield, and you feel a mild peace. Now, go from that mild peace to fall through your chair. Oh. You know, even here in the room, the anointing increased on that, so people must have been sneaking and doing it in this room. Because, But do you see what you put in the atmosphere? You can fool people with your words, you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what comes from you. Matter of fact, we taught this to uh, a guy when we were traveling, and there was, uh, they had a bunch of guest speakers. I can't remember which one, but one of the guest speakers, after we did this with him, he went up and he said, okay, now everyone in the audience, we're going to worship without words. And the atmosphere in the room changed dramatically. How much more with words? Yes. But it just shows you, you can fool people with your words, you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what's coming from you. And that includes walls, attitudes. I actually, for, I had, it took me time to not be embarrassed for people who think, and I'm going, but God, it's so obvious. Do other people know how obvious they are? Do they know how obvious they are? And he showed me a picture, and it was a strange picture, but he showed me a picture, you know what a dandelion looks like? A single dandelion, a little gold little flower with a little tiny stem. We used to make stuff out of the stems and play with them. But God says, they're like hiding behind a dandelion, thinking that you can't see them. I would rather yield to God and be real. And God's looking. He's real. 
He wants you to know that reality. And by the way, truth and reality are synonymous. He wants you to be real. That is reality. And Jesus is reality. So how to fully yield yourself. You, you want to learn to practice yielding, even if you're kind of like a yo-yo at first and it's up and down. You want to... By reason of use, you have your senses exercised. So yes, you will need to practice it because your senses will want to argue with it. But ultimately, let God have the last word. Say, God. And as soon as you go, God, you realize you just change your focus down to Jesus in you. Now, when we traveled, we saw a weakness in that concept because we would say, God. Uh, Jesus, the Messiah in you, the hope of glory. Quick, point to Jesus. 98% of the congregation that we were in pointed to heaven. I live here. Everything good is here. Conscience, the seat of the emotions, the will, the door of the heart. As long as your my bucket is down here, bucket is focused. As long as my focus is down here, I'm aware of what's going on in the atmosphere. So learning to yield, the grace of yielding, would be an extremely important. And what would it do if you were to teach a, 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 a new person who is on fire for God? Of course, they want to do, 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 even the wrong thing compared to nothing. They're terrified of doing nothing. Nothing is actually the place to where the communion really gets fortified. <laughs> so... But what would, you, what, what would you teach them to do? You tell them, quiet that noisy flesh. Get still. And what you're doing is you're strengthening that muscle. I, we, we were just in a meeting recently when I heard someone say, oh, we have to pray. I, 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 you just got to pray for me. I got to pray for patience. All the fruit of the Spirit's love. You don't pray for patience. And patience is nothing more than the love of God holding the heart open. Hmm? Holding the heart open till love comes through. Without shutting down. Hope and open are synonymous. Faith is now. Hope is open. Love it never fails. So why not just hold the heart open? Why not let love hold the heart open? Stay open. Love never fails. Well, you have a better idea? You want to take matters in your own hand? Patience is nothing more than faith and patience receiving the promise. Holding the heart open. Don't pray for it. That was like Jennifer when we first got married. Praying to forgive some relative, calling God in heaven to come down here and fix that for me, please. We don't want to teach newbies that. Uh -uh. He's already down here, and hopefully if you're a believer, he's already in your heart. Now, the third one is, according to our publisher's description, they have learned steps to breaking free from toxic emotions that war against the closeness with God. That's very perceptive on their part. Because remember, what did I say? God supernaturally said, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I are having together. And that was any, any emotion. Anxiety particularly, because that means the opposite of prayer. Be anxious for nothing but by prayer. So anxiety in all its form is you're not in relationship with God at that. Now, you didn't lose your salvation. You lost fellowship. There's a difference between a relationship and fellowship. Relationship is something that you have in him you're born again but fellowship you walk in the light as he is in the light you have fellowship one with another you love God you love people you're connected and you're walking in that connection and his blood continually cleanses you so you don't want something to come between that it's not really worth it so steps to breaking free from toxic emotions that was the first thing we learned it wars against the closeness with God but the importance of forgiving had to be taught. That's the fourth element. The third element, you learn how to break free from toxic emotions. But the fourth element is the importance of forgiving from the secret place.
I'm, I'm impressed with our publishers. They, they've got a good handle on our material. <laughs> huh? I guess that's their job. They need to learn that, right? And lay it out in a way that other people can understand it. So I'm going to use their material to explain it. The importance of forgiving from the secret place. Uh, I know Sid loves that topic. Dennis, tell him who's, who's, who's doing the forgiving. Okay? Because sincerely sorry people are living in pain. They're bleeding on the inside, but they are sincerely sorry when you do it from the head. Sincere, I don't care how sincere or how sorry you are sincerely, if, if you still got pain on the inside, that is not biblical forgiveness. Forgiveness is when you can remember the incident without the pain. If there's pain, you did not do it. You probably have to go deeper, which means you didn't do it. So the importance of forgiving from the secret place, it's only God can forgive sin. And yet the scripture says, unless you forgive. So it's you and God doing the forgiving. If it's not, if it's just you in your head being sincerely sorry, you cut God out of the loop. The name of Jesus, Benny Hinn said that once, Benny, uh, the name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. You know, So forgiveness doesn't work in the flesh either. Love doesn't work in the flesh. Forgiveness doesn't work in the flesh. It's going to have to be that co-laboring new creation, you and Jesus doing it. That's the importance of forgiving from the secret place. Then lastly, and this is the, our entire mission, if people would not misunderstand and think that this is all navel staring, which you will burn out if you do, you know, I'm tired of looking in. Well, you know what? They're tired of looking in. You're doing it wrong. I'm tired of having a relationship with Jesus is what you're saying. I'm tired of trying to fix myself. That's what you're saying. I, well, that's not going to work. Most of the time we spend in the presence of God is enjoyment. If that's not part of it, then, you, then I don't know what you're doing, but you're making it harder than it needs to be. Most of the time I spend is enjoyment, and it's mostly like a game to even do, like Jennifer and I used to go walk in the South Park Mall and just release love to people, that, strangers that are walking around. And eventually some people come up, some people will comment, and we didn't say anything. You, 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 you a street evangelist? I'll give you a challenge. How about presence evangelism? How many people have come up to you simply because they could feel something that they couldn't put their finger on? Presence evangelism. Whoa. There's power evangelism, and that's better than program evangelism. Program evangelism is just knocking on doors, hanging out, track. That's, all of these things can be of value, but I'll tell you what. The highest form of communication is to be an expression. Jesus told... Uh, <clears throat> Philip, Philip, you want to see the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's communication. Of course, then Jesus is the Word. The Word was made flesh. The Word of the one of Jesus and his Word are one. No. So the last bullet, fifth bullet, how do I stay in peace regardless of circumstances? That's full stature. That's what we're teaching. That's the part that will either frustrate a person or you it's caught more than it's taught. And that is you make yourself accountable in that relationship with God that any time you lose your peace, it's really not that important. Don't let anything come between what you and God have together. Peace is not just an inner harmony or New Age or Eastern concept. It involves harmony, but it's a harmony where Jesus is Lord. Mind, will, and emotions are subordinate. They're cooperating with it. And that unity and communion is will keep you in peace, regardless of your circumstances. We, we shared with a guy that was kind of 
uh, taken back when I was telling them a little bit about the peace of God, the militancy, how the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet, and then that how uh, God appeared to Gideon for battle as Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, and he went, oh, the shoes of peace to crush the enemy. I've never heard that teaching before. It's better get that teaching out there then, right? To me, that's foundational. That's one of the elements here, how to stay in peace. And of course, the, the, even Sid had the reenactment of when I worked at a halfway house with ex-prisoners. And that guy pulled a knife. Uh, protocol says, get out of the way, let him go, call the police. But I was so infatuated with the relationship I had with God that when I felt peace increase, when he pulled a knife on me, peace increased when he pulled a knife on me, I'll take that peace any day. And I stayed there. Next thing you know, his hand trembled, dropped the knife, dropped to his knees. That's God. That's a relationship. You want to you wanna call peace passive or I ain't got time for peace. I'm on an adrenaline high right now. Good for you. But that's not the way I'm going to live. And Bill Morford that wrote the One New Man Bible, he said, Dennis Clark has clearly revealed that he has more confidence in the peace of God than all the reasoning ability put together. I get weary of Christians reasoning. Do you realize how easy it is that apart from intimacy with God, a lot of your reasoning goes into judging there's nothing meaner on the face of the earth than an angry religious person. We went to Russia. We saw military men crying and kneeling. We saw drunks in the park getting saved and delivered instantly. I mean, they, they, in the parks there, you, you take your beer with you and you go sit in the park. That, that was it. We saw them getting saved. We saw people getting healed. And then all of a sudden, the Russian clergy came. Full battle array black robes, black hat, black everything. And I mean, you want to see what a demon looked like. Just look at the expression on their face. You don't need, need discernment. The meanest people can be religious people. You want to train young people. I don't care if they're Jesus freaks like in my day or, or what you want to call them. In other words, you need sensitivity that they are a human being that Jesus died for and he loves them. But if you ever start looking like that person, like those religious person, I mean, I would think they would be embarrassed if they could just see each other, how they were all snarling and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> Gee, that sounds like scripture. Uh, <laughs> and you know what? You know what they were gnashing their teeth at? When we were in Russia, uh, there was a, a team that were doing. I don't even understand. Well, it was a little bit of mime, you know, a little acting out stuff. And then they'd stand, they'd do a little pyramid, <laughs> like you'd see it at a football game or something, do a little pyramid, jump down. And, and then they would witness for Jesus a, a lot just visually. Now, did that require the gnashing of teeth of a religious order? You know? Was that that upsetting? Isn't that something? Nothing meaner than an angry religious person. Nothing more judgmental than a religious person. The distinction has to be made. You practice the presence of God. You fall in love with peace. And I'll tell you one thing. You won't live in suspicion, and you certainly won't use the word discernment for your attitude. Your attitude and discernment are not the same thing. If you have a stinky attitude... People could probably discern your fragrance. The real key, the real key is to stay in peace regardless of circumstances. And it is possible or God wouldn't have you say, let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. Either it guards your heart and your mind or you don't want it to. You'd rather do it your way. I like that description. Hmm? Throughout the Bible, um, the 
facing a Jesus revolution today, if all of a sudden people would come, I'd say the other thing that we would be taught that we, I wasn't taught, um, I talked with uh, Brian Simmons, said he was trained by some of the best evangelical leaders, and he was taught that, I was taught that, many people were taught, ignore your feelings. You can't live by your feelings, and there's a half-truth in there. But if you carry that too far, then you have absolutely no insight to the fruit of the Spirit. The reason you were given emotions by God was that they would be conduits for the fruit of the Spirit. So we're taught, yes, God's thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my thoughts, but His love is higher than my love. Mother love is one of the most beautiful things we have in the world, but God's love is superior to it. So we have an emotional God. He doesn't just have emotions. He is a love God by nature. His nature, his essence is love. God is love. He who abides in God and God in him. God does not simply possess it. He is it. And that's 1 John four sixteen. The entire atmosphere, Jennifer was amazed at this because I, I showed her where the toxic emotions were in Scripture, and it was after the garden, after they got kicked out, by the way, after they got rejected. Rejection registers in the brain the same place as personal pain, physical pain. So the entire atmosphere of the garden was permeated with the love, joy, and peace of God, the emotions of God, the God emotions. I would say to new, new believers, if they start hearing from some of the older people that were taught that nonsense, well, now you can't live by your emotion. <sighs> Jonathan Edwards saw people coming to the altar during the uh, Great Awakening, and he says, the ones that cried, repented, and wept were changed. He said, the ones that stayed in their head as know-it-alls remained the same. It's hard for know-it-alls to get truth. Human emotions were created to be transmitters of the supernatural fruit of God. That's the way to look at it. By golly, make, make amends with your emotions and offer them to God as a living sacrifice and say, you know what? Now I'm not only offering my body, I'm offering my mind, my will, my emotion. I'm offering all of it to you. And I'm wild emotions, thoughts, and choices, they need to be corralled. I can, I can see to this day <laughs> that we just fell in love with the 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 6 in the message. It has everything a new person would want or need in that one verse if you took them and walked them through it. Now, we know it as uh, the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, of every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's the replacing of lies with the truth. But in the message, it, it really says that we learn to use our spiritual tools that are in us. Well, but wouldn't it be easier if I just went over there and, and had somebody lay hands on me? And then wouldn't it be easier if I just did that over there? Wouldn't it be easier if I just did this, did that? And I'm going, might be some value in that. But ultimately, someday, you're going to be on your own. What's your relationship with God like when you're on your own and there's nothing over there to run to? When you learn to use your spiritual tools, it says we have these powerful God tools, the message translation. They're ready and they're at hand. So that cuts through the excuses. Well, I need somebody special to do their thing to me. There's a place for that. Confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. And you know who usually needs that? At some point, God says, you know what? You're doing a fine job, me and you, me and you, me and you. But I'm going to bring you some issues in your life that you're going to need someone else just to keep you humble. Not as a lifestyle, but just to keep you humble that you can't do everything yourself. So you don't get too independent in this process. That just me and God, 
surfboard Christians, just me and God surfing on the way. I don't need anybody. Just me and him out here in the beauty of the ocean. Man, if your surfboard breaks, you're going to be looking for somebody to fix it. Now, I believe in that God saying that we're facing a Jesus revolution today. Let's learn from the past and let's not repeat the same mistakes that were made <clears throat> in the previous things. You know, you really don't change history, but you should learn from it. Don't you think? And say, learn from history so that you don't repeat it. And say, what kind of an adjustment could I make? And really, those bullets were all the adjustments I would make based on what I was taught in the early years. And now, in hindsight, I am so thrilled that God didn't let me go to Bible school first. I'm going to send you for a year and a half, two years, to the School of the Spirit. And then I took everybody's Bible school course after that. But what are we teaching now? Primarily the best of what I was taught in the first year and a half, two years in the School of the Spirit. All of the other stuff was like icing on the cake. It was good stuff, but I wouldn't trade it for anything compared to what we learned. Because this is where people are going to be helped in the days ahead. And we're going to war against new believer burnout where they substitute religion or works for a deeper relationship with God, which is the abundant life. Do you want abundant life or you want activity or do you want an adrenaline rush? Those will be the choices they'll face. And yet very tenderly and very sensitively, you're going to have to draw them to stay closer to God and learn some discipline. Hmm? Boy, that's a favorite word for everybody. I can picture a new baby Christian going, use the word discipline. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it's going to require, isn't it? What was it? What was it that statement that person made? Deliverance, discipline, and domination. Rule. I don't know if I have that right, but the principle works. You need deliverance from the world, translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. Then you need some discipline. You've got to practice that. You don't do it one time and say, ha, I did it. <laughs> you go from deliverance to discipline to dominion or dominant. Let the peace of God rule. You're under God's authority. So I don't want to... Uh, increase that attention to emotions. Now, I'll just talk with some other people. Okay, but when you say that, you know, there's some people that are not emotional. Everybody's emotional. Those are the people, if they say they're not emotional, they're the ones with the problems. Those are the ones that have breakdowns. They don't have emotions, which means they found a way to avoid tactics, defense mechanisms. God didn't make anybody without emotions. And he made them for the fruit of the Spirit. So you're going to say, I can't enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. Everything's not an emotion. Well, I got a cure for you. Do you want Jesus to be Lord over every area of your life? then let's lay aside just the emotions, which you can't, and say, how about your spirit? Is your spirit under the authority of God? Is your conscience clean in your spirit? How about your thoughts? His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You ever have any runaway thoughts that are kind of troubling? What about your emotions? Oh, that's right, you didn't have any emotions. Okay, mean, meaning you don't have any good ones. because you, you don't have emotions, so you can't have the fruit of the spirit because they require the emotions as conduits. Okay, how about your physical body? Is Jesus Lord of your physical body? Are you welcoming healing and wholeness? Do you have judgments against yourself? Any autoimmune issues? Those are usually unforgiveness towards yourself. Oh, physical body. Okay, now let's go to... Let's see, I want spirit, mind, will, emotions, physical body, all my relationships. 
That means your enemies too. That means the boss at work. That means the people that like you and the people that don't like you. All of those relationships, is Jesus Lord over all of those? Don't worry about your emotions. Just ask, answer that question. Are all of those relationships under the love of God? And if so, how do you know if you don't have emotions? How do you know? You love your enemies? You bless them? That, hmm? Okay, next one. How about all of your possessions? This is a little easier. Because I love my car. I love my toothpaste. I love my this. I love my boat. <laughs> you love it or you lust it? Oh, no, you can't, be, you can't lust anything because you don't have emotions. You can't lust after anything. So you can, what? I can theoretically like my car. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very comfortable with that thought. You think we need help? I think we need the love of God so desperately that nothing can replace it. But it's going to require, he made us a thinking, feeling, choosing being. He made us that way. Then I think you're not, you're not a real Christian unless you've offered all three of them to him. God made me a thinking, feeling, choosing being, and I want all three of those under the lordship of Jesus. It's not about being saved and then quitting and living your life whatever way you want. It's not fire insurance. It's about lordship. Is he lord over all of those areas? That's where the real test is. So, Father, I pray right now for people listening. If there's some newbie who's just tuned in for the first time saying, I just accepted Jesus. I don't know what he's talking about most of the time. But if I would take a list of those five things that were important, I can at least pursue them. Take a list of those five elements and begin to pursue them. Father, we pray right now that they would, they would just begin to say, God, I'm new of all this, but I want the whispers of the Father. I want to, God speaking to me. Morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear. Isaiah 50, verse 4, that's what he trained me with. He trained me to hear his whispers. Isaiah 50, verse 4, morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear. And you know what else he told me? He told me, shut up, Dennis, because you haven't, <laughs> you haven't, because I was talking away. I was calling it prayer. <clears throat> And, and you know what else, God? And you know what? Like, like he don't know. You, know. you have to inform him of what you need and what you think. And yet, he said, shut up. You don't have anything worth saying until you've heard something from me. Oh, kind of like in school, Dennis. Well, I don't know if I was that good in school. But in school, it was like the teacher did the talking. And you were supposed to do the listening and answer only when called upon. And God was saying, I'm trying to do that with you, Dennis, but you won't shut up. <laughs> It must, have been, it must have been generational because my dad had that. He was in his late 80s, and he was confronted by two that were over 100 in Canada of his relatives. And they went, oh, yeah, yeah, we remember you. You were that noisy little kid that never shut up. So it was generational, so I released forgiveness to him. And, I, and God says, you're not going to have anything worth saying until you've heard something. And that requires listening, being a better listener than a talker. And God, I want to learn to yield myself to that. And it, at first it was kind of antsy because you. I wanted to go walk and pace and pray. And I had to die to that. And then I had thoughts all over the map. And I had to die to that and write it down and say, I'll go do it later. And forgiving, oh, that was so beautiful at first, until I realized, man, you have a lot of people and things you need to forgive. Oh, man, you got to go to work. you got to probably have to forgive everybody there. Oh, no, how do I do all this and still get anything done? But fortunately, they get farther and farther apart, and you start walking in the abundance of the life that God has given to you. So... Practice makes permanent. Keep it up. And the forgiveness must come from the heart, not the head, or you struggle needlessly. And you learn to stay in peace regardless of circumstances. Now, remember, if someone has historically 
pushed your buttons and you see them from afar coming towards you, you go, down here, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and just acknowledging him. He will guard your heart and your mind, so no matter what that person throws at you, it doesn't go in. Isn't that nice? All right, so now practice, practice, practice. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you that we have at least two lessons to face a Jesus revelation, uh, revolution uh, today. Amen? Amen. 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 You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.